Welcome once again to Gilbert and Sullivan Radio Theater. This is your host, Jerry Tracy, inviting you to join us as we survey all 14 of the comic opera masterpieces of Gilbert and Sullivan in chronological order. Our musical excerpts are drawn from the vast radio theater collection and include great recorded classics from the past as well as modern performances. And our dialogue highlights feature our own beloved KBCS players. KBCS News, Farm Report, and Gilbert and Sullivan Plot Summary Services, this is Meredith Hunt reporting. Those few of you who tuned in last week will recall that our action is set in the South Pacific Isle Utopia. On the face of things, this island is ruled by King Paramount, but our investigation has determined that, as in other third world nations, an effete, well-organized aristocracy wields the real power behind the throne. Utopian Supreme Court Justices Scapio and Fantas have threatened the king with immediate explosion by Tarara, the public exploder. Should he not bend to their arbitrary and self-serving wishes? The return of the king's daughter, Princess Zara, from an English college seems to hold out a slim prospect of reform, however. The princess has returned with a brain trust of six English experts, whom the Utopians refer to as the Flowers of Progress. Informed sources close to the king report that Scapio and Fantas are not at all pleased with this development. It is also widely rumored that both of these gentlemen have fallen in love with Princess Zara, who has herself been romantically linked with her young military escort, Captain Fitz Battleaxe of the First Lifeguards. As if these steamy royal goings-ons weren't enough, the king himself is reported to have developed quite an interest in the Lady Sophie, who is governess to his younger daughters, the Princess Nakaya and Kaliba. Lady Sophie is believed to be spurning the king's attentions because of his failure to suppress the island's one newspaper, the Palace Peeper. A society journal deeply critical of the king. <laughs> this just in. Just got it. Looking at it now. Thank you. Informed sources report that the king himself composes the scurrilous articles in the palace peeper at the behest of Scapio and Fantas. For fast-breaking developments, let's return to the action. Meredith Hunt reporting for KBCS, a news tradition. Good day. The king, the princesses Nikaya and Kaliba, and Lady Sophie enter. As the king enters, the escort presents arms. <laughs> Zara, <laughs> my beloved daughter. Oh, how well you look. My, how lovely you have grown. And he embraces his daughter. My dear father. She embraces and my him. my two beautiful little sisters. And then... Not beautiful, nice looking. But first, let me present to you the English warrior who commands my escort and who has taken, oh, such care of me during the voyage, Captain Fitz Battleaxe. <laughs> Princess exit in one direction, the life guardsmen in the crowd in the opposite direction. At the back, Scafio and Fantas, the two wise men, enter. They watch Princess Zara as she goes off. Scafio is seated, shaking violently and obviously under the influence of some strong emotion. There, tell me, Scafio, oh. is she not oh. beautiful? Oh. Can you wonder why no. I love her so passionately? Oh, no. She is extraordinarily, miraculously lovely. Good heavens, what a singularly beautiful girl. I knew you would say so. What exquisite charm of manner. Such surprising delicacy of gesture. Why, she's a goddess, a very goddess. Yeah. Yes, she's she's an attractive girl. Attractive? Well, you must be blind. She's entrancing, enthralling, intoxicating. God, bless my heart, what's the matter with me? Yes, you you promised to help me get your father's consent, you know. Promised, yes. But the convulsion has come, my good boy. It is she, my ideal. Why, what's this? 
Fancy, stop me. I'm going mad, mad with love of her. Scapio, <laughs> compose yourself, I beg. The girl is perfectly opaque. Besides, remember, each of us is helpless without the other. You can't succeed without my consent, you know. And you dare to threaten? Oh, ungrateful. When you came to me, palsied with love for this girl, and implored my assistance, did I not unhesitatingly promise it? Well, yeah. And this is the return you make. Out of my sight, ingrate. Dear me, what's the matter with me? Captain Pitt's battle axe enters with Princess Zara. They are arm in arm. Dear me, I'm afraid we're interrupting a tete-a-tete. -tete. No, no. You come very appropriately. <laughs> oh, to be brief, we love you, this man and I, mm -hmm. madly, passionately. Yes. Sir! And we don't know how we are to settle which of us is to marry you. Oh, Zora, this is very, very awkward. I, I am paralyzed by the singular radiance of your extraordinary loveliness. I know I am incoherent. I never was like this before. It shall not occur again. I shall be fluent presently. Oh, dear. Captain Fitz Battleax, what is to be done? Leave it to me, Cherub. I'll manage it. In a common situation, why not settle it in an English fashion? The English, English fashion? fashion? What's what that? is that? It's very, very simple. In England, when two gentlemen are in love with the same lady, and until it is settled which gentleman is to blow out the brains of the other, it is provided by the Rival Admirers Clause Consolidation Act that the lady shall be entrusted to an officer of household cavalry as stakeholder who is bound to hand her over to the survivor mm -hmm. in a good condition of substantial and decorative repair. Mm. Reasonable wear and tear and damages by fire accepted. Exactly. Well, that seems very reasonable. What do you say? Shall we entrust her to this officer of household cavalry? It will I'm, give us time. I'm not at present in a condition to think it out coolly. But if he is an officer of the household cavalry... And, uh, if the princess consents... Alas, mm -hmm. dear sirs, I have no alternative under the Rival Admirers Clause's Consolidation Act. Good, then it's settled. It's understood, I think, around that by the English cast about my King Paramount enters. My daughter, at last we are alone together. Yes, and I'm glad we are, for I want to speak to you very seriously. Do you know this paper? Oh, yes, oh, uh, yes I've, I've seen it. Where in the world did you get that from? It was given to me by Lady Sophie, oh. my sister's governess. Lady Sophie's an angel, but I do sometimes wish she'd mind her own business. Well, it's... <laughs> it's rather humorous. I see nothing humorous in it. Mm. I only see that you, the despotic king of this country, are made the subject of the most scandalous insinuations. Why do you permit these things? What? Look at this cartoon. Why do they represent you with such a big nose? Oh, what? Oh, <laughs> yes, it is rather big, isn't it? Uh, why, the fact is uh, that in the cartoons of a comic paper, the size of your nose always varies inversely as the square of your popularity. It's the rule. Then you must be at a tremendous discount just now. <coughs> My dear father, if you were a free agent, you would never permit these outrages. Oh, Zara, I... Oh... I admit, oh, I'm not altogether a free agent. <laughs> I, I'm controlled. Oh, I try to make the best of it, but sometimes I find it very difficult. Very difficult indeed. Nominally a despot I am, uh, between ourselves the helpless tool of two unscrupulous wise men who insist on my falling in with all their wishes. 
Oh, and threatened to denounce me for immediate explosion if I remonstrate. <laughs> My poor father. Pull yourself together. Now, listen to me. With a view to remodeling the political and social institutions of Utopia, I have brought with me six representatives... Wait. Yes. Hold on. Six representatives. They're very important men of the principal causes that have tended to make England the powerful, happy, and blameless country which the consensus of European civilization has declared it to be. <sighs> Place yourself unreservedly in the hands of these gentlemen, and they will reorganize your country on a footing that will enable you to defy your persecutors <sighs> and pass your health care plan. They are all now <laughs> washing their hands after the journey. Shall I introduce them? Please, oh yes, my dear Zara, how can I thank you? Oh, I will consent to anything, anything that will release me from the abominable tyranny of these two men. <laughs> oh, well, what, oh, uh, without the... Yes! Summon my court without an instant's delay! I am. Our Act Two curtain rises to. Our Act Two curtain rises. Oh, sorry. To discover the throne room in the palace. It is night. Captain Fitzbattleaxe is discovered singing to Princess Zara. <laughs> and let's cut to the doily cart recording very quickly. What does it matter when the highest qualities of the heart are all that can be desired? The higher notes of the voice are matters of comparative insignificance. Who thinks slightingly of the coconut because it is husky? Besides, you are not singing for an engagement. You have that already. Oh, how good and wise you are. My goat in training, Arthur. But tell me, is it not all working marvelously well? Have not our flowers of progress more than justified their name? We have indeed done our best. Captain Corcoran and I have, in concert, thoroughly remodeled the sister services, and upon so sound a basis that the South Pacific trembles at the name of Utopia. How clever of you! Mm, clever? Not a bit. Well, maybe perhaps just a tiny little bit. Yeah, you're probably laughing. Yeah, not a bit. Not a bit. <laughs> but per perhaps the most beneficial change of all has been effected by Mr. Goldberry, who has applied the limited liability principle to individuals, and every man, woman, and child is now a company limited with liability restricted to the amount of his declared capital. There is not a baby in Utopia who has not already issued his little prospectus. Oh, marvellous. Yes, it is. And when I tell you, dearest, that my court train has just arrived, you will understand that I am longing to go and try it on. Oh, then we must part. Necessarily, for a time. Just as I wanted to tell you, with all the passionate enthusiasm of my nature, how deeply, how devotedly, I love you. Hush. Are these the accents of a heart that really, truly feels... True love does not indulge in declamation. Its voice is sweet and soft and low.
Well, we thank you once again for joining us and hope you enjoyed this episode of Utopia Limited or The Flowers of Progress. Our thanks as well to the talented KBCS players. Steve Smith portrayed King Paramount the first, the King of Utopia. Penelope Rakopoulos was Scafio, Dan Reinking Fantis, our villains. Gary Jones was Terrara, the public exploder. Deidre Kilgore portrayed Kalinx, the Utopian Vice Chamberlain. Jeff Hogan portrayed Lord Dromalay and also Captain Fitzbattleaxe, and very well too. Uh, as uh, Mr. Goldbury, we heard uh, Jerry Tracy. As Princess Zara, Meredith Hunt, Deidre Kilgore and Deanne Odom portrayed the young princesses, Nakaya and Kaliba. And Janet Smith portrayed the Lady Sophie. We certainly thank you for listening once again and invite you to join us next episode. <laughs>